Section number 13 of Meller of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Meller of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages by David Byrne. Lovers of Learning when that learned Irish monk Tathai settled at Gwent, in Monmouthshire, he had twelve pupils and one cow. And excepting his books, he had very little else, so that the milk of that one cow formed a very important item in the daily fare of the doctor and his scholars. In the Wales of the sixth century there were many petty kings, and Gundalu, prince of Brecknockshire, was one of them. A turbulent person who, with the help of three hundred of his vassals, had stolen the beautiful daughter of a neighboring king and made her his bride. It is to be feared that he stole almost everything that took his fancy. But when his men carried off the poor monk's one cow, its lawful owner immediately started to remonstrate with the robber chief. Tathai was in bed when the robbers came. But directly he heard of his loss, he set out for the castle of King Gundalu, arriving there in an important and, as it turned out, an auspicious hour. That very night a son had been born to the king, who seems to have had some knowledge of, even if he did not practice, the Catholic religion. At any rate, he not only restored the stolen cow, but begged the good monk to baptize the newly born child. Tathai did this very joyfully, giving the babe the name of Kadok. What is more, he promised that when the boy was old enough, he would take charge of his education and upbringing. So when little Kadok, in Celtic, the name means warlike, was seven years old, he was sent to the monk's school informing his master that he had already been taught to hunt and fight. The monk was not a professor either of fighting or of hunting, but he at once began to teach the little prince the grammar of Priscian and Donatus. Many other useful and important things did the Irish doctor teach his pupil. Cadoc not only learnt his psalter, but began to use it. Prayer soon became to him a regular habit, and his attachment to his holy master grew deep. Prince, as he was, he showed himself the very willing and affectionate servant of his tutor, lighting the fire, cooking the dinner, and serving at table. All these things he did for twelve long years, developing as time went on such a love of study that the monk began to hope Kadok might some day wear the tonsure instead of his father's crown. Tathai's hopes were realized. When Kadok reached the age of nineteen, he gladly accepted his tutor's suggestion of a course of higher studies at the famous Irish monastic school at Lismore. After remaining there for some time, he returned to Wales in order to join a renowned British rhetorician lately come from Rome. In order to join a renowned British rhetorician lately come from Rome a professor who taught the humanities after the best Roman method. Unfortunately, this learned doctor was very poor, and so many scholars flocked to him that very soon something like famine made itself felt. It seems probable that the learned monk had taken possession of a deserted farmhouse, for one day Kadok was sitting studying in his cell and trying to forget how very hungry he was, a mouse jumped on the little table and dropped thereon a grain of corn. It is quite possible, as the old chronicler says, that Kadok did not see either mouse or grain, but when it returned with a second and third and continued until seven grains lay before the young student's eyes, he began to reason about the matter. At such a time, even one small sack of wheat would be most acceptable, 
and if only he could follow the mouse he might at least discover some little forgotten or unheard of store the supply may have been miraculous it is probable that Kadok and his master thought it was so but at any rate when they began to search the cellars to their lasting joy and thankfulness they found an enormous heap of corn a supply not only sufficient for their own wants but for those of the poor of the neighborhood though he was heir to his father's kingdom Kadok had not the smallest intention of becoming king having finished his studies he began to lead the life of a solitary with the resolution of building a monastery and opening a school as he was an only son he knew that sooner or later he would inherit considerable property his design was to build a big abbey and open up a great seat of learning and sanctity at that time wales was filled with forest land the wild boar and wolf were everywhere from his infancy Kadok had hunted both so that while he was looking for a suitable building site the appearance of an enormous boar white with age did not scare him indeed he was interested in the leaps of the big shaggy creature as it made three bounds one after the other turning each time to glare at the intruder Kadok took up three fallen branches and carefully marked the three spaces cleared by the boar here i will build my church he said to himself here shall be the dormitories and here the refractory in course of time the great abbey of lencarven became a reality this ecclesia Severum, or church of the stags was so named because says the legend two stags offered themselves to replace two weary monks who found the work of dragging timber too laborious lincarvin grew into a magnificent center of usefulness the labor of clearing the forest and of building the monastery was enormous yet directly the monks had finished their domicile they set to work plowing the land and sowing it with corn more important still the abbey developed into a great religious and literary school first and foremost among its duties were the study of the bible and the writing out of its various books transcription of latin authors and their commentators followed this for Kadok was a scholar of the best type and like the poet of a later age next to divine wisdom he loved his virgil like dante too he was a poet a renowned professor of that day was st gildas well known in ireland where he had both studied and lectured and also at the great seat of learning glasenbury to the monks of this famous abbey he taught the seven liberal arts so successfully that all his pupils became masters for one whole year did gildas the wise lecture at lancarven desiring no payment but the prayers of his pupils moreover during the same period he copied out the entire book of the gospels for the use of the abbey whose welcome guest he long remained with the monk came the monastery says a protestant he had taught for years at the great cathedral school of armagh founded by saint an establishment that might fitly have been called a university boys were sent here from every part of europe and by the ninth century it boasted seven thousand students for centuries ireland was known as the land of saints and scholars writer with the monastery came the school and to the gentler spirit a new home was open a new and noble vocation offered the sixth century saw schools established in britain and the first fruits of learning in the appearance of a native author the monk gildas surnamed the wise pupils from all parts flock lancarven many of them being the sons of kings and chieftains like that of every true artist and teacher Kadok's motto was decore cum delection to make instruction pleasant as well as profitable 
years afterwards his pupils remembered and quoted the little verses and poetical aphorisms they had learnt in the cloister school at Lancarvin. One good prince of North Wales loved to repeat two sentences taught to him by Cadoc. Remember that thou art a man, there is no king, like him who is king of himself. We may imagine how many prayers and what severe penances Cadoc offered for the conversion of his father and mother. Fierce and rapacious as the king was, it is clear that he had a certain respect for the Christian religion. The man who begged for baptism for his son, who gladly permitted him to be brought up and educated by a holy monk, was no deliberate hater of righteousness. But when a man who is dear to God begins to importune heaven, we are never surprised at the result. Cadoc was not content with prayer and penance. To his father's house he sent a holy embassy of three monks who, after taking counsel of the lords of the country, began to preach repentance in the king's presence. From the first, Cadoc's mother was deeply touched. The preaching of the monks and the pleading of the queen soon had the desired effect. Our son shall now become our father, she said to her husband. With great joy did Cadoc receive and obey the summons to visit his father and mother. Nothing would content the king and queen but a public confession of their sins. Let all my race obey Cadoc with true piety, was Gundaloo's decree. No wonder they chanted together the psalm, Ex Cadouet te Domingus in de tribulationis. The sincerity and thoroughness of their conversions cannot be doubted. Husband and wife both retired from court and took up their abode in two little cabins at a short distance from each other. There they lived in great peace and content, working with their hands and subsisting on barley bread and cresses. Their saintly son paid them frequent visits giving them the best spiritual help and instruction and becoming to them a deeply venerated spiritual father. As time went on, the king and queen became more and more in love with solitude and with holy things, each of them seeking a deeper retirement and a more complete union with God. When the day came upon which Gundaloo died in the arms of his saintly son, the latter found himself very rich. Cadoc could not rid himself of his inheritance. He could and did use it for the good of the people who now regarded him as their king. For them a golden age had indeed begun. At once, abbot and prince, Cadoc proved himself the father and protector of the poor, the courageous and determined defender of his people's rights and liberties. Men always knew when they entered the territory of Cadoc. So deep was its peace, so actual its prosperity. Happy indeed were the poor who lived under Cadoc's crook, a scepter, at once more gentle and more powerful than that held by any mere secular pontate. The truest of true knights was this holy abbot, ever careful to right wrongs, to defend the honor of women, and to protect the patrimony of the poor. Yet it seems probable that he never had recourse to arms, though he maintained at his own cost a hundred knights and a hundred servants. Besides these, he supported a hundred priests and gave education to all the numerous children sent to him. Fierce were the times and constant the harryings of robber chieftains, of tyrant kings and their followers, harp in hand and at the head of fifty monks chanting psalms Cadoc would go out to meet, and to overcome, a band of marauders. His courage was unbounded, and what these poor pagans attributed to magic was of course nothing but the exercise of that fearless morale force that he, in common with so many holy men, possessed. Like a mighty deluge came the Saxon invasion. Its horrors and profanations reached even to the banks of the Severn and of the Usk. 
and the peaceful domains of Cadoc became the theater of bloodshed and war. As others of his countrymen had done, Cadoc fled to Britain, taking with him Gildas. They could not be idle, though content enough to lead the life of solitaries, choosing indeed a cave in the little desert island of Ronac. Disciples from the mainland sought them out and compelled them to dispense both human and divine knowledge. Day after day came the boys and young men of Brittany in their poor little boats to sit at the feet of Cadoc and Gildas. Won by their eagerness to learn and, and delighted with the progress they made, Cadoc actually set to work to construct a sort of bridge from his island to the coast of France. He had brought with him his Virgil, as well as the sacred scriptures, and from these two books Cadot and Gildas taught their pupils. Where the wild waves lapped the shores of their little island home walked Cadot and Gildas. Boisterously blew the wind as friend talked with friend, as one saint held converse with another. Knowledge was theirs in common, but the bond that bound them together in closest friendship was their love of God and the souls for whom he died. Close tucked beneath the arm of St. Cadoc was a precious parchment copy of his famous poet, Virgil. Precious indeed was that handwritten book, for from it Cadoc not only taught the Brittany children, boys who in shallow boats daily left the mainland for Cadot's island school, but his affection for it was great, and, with a modern writer, he would have said, every Christian loves to walk with Virgil as long as he can, and he will only leave him if he be obliged to leave him at the last extremity, and with tears in his eyes. On this windy morning there were tears in the eyes of St. Cadot, tears that were not forthdrawn by the buffeting sea breeze or left upon his furrowed cheeks by the spray of the ocean so much i love him the scholar saint was saying to his scholar companion yet even at this very moment he may perchance be enduring the torments of the damned but gildas holy man as he was for a moment forgot himself there can be no perchance in virgil's case he retorted how comes it, Cadoc, that you can dare to doubt as to the damnation of this pagan poet? Then curious and startling was the thing that happened. Whether for a moment Cadoc relaxed his hold upon the precious volume, or whether a sudden and violent gust of wind snatched the book from his embrace, who shall say? But even as Gilda spoke, away flew the parchment into the air, only to be swallowed up in the billows of a wind-tossed sea. Was Cadoc to regard the occurrence as a confirmation of Gildas's judgment, the judgment that seemed to be, and was, so harsh? To the owner of the book it appeared to be so. His sorrow had been great before. He was now plunged into a very agony of grief. Leaving his friend, Cadoc returned to his cell. Long and earnest was his prayer, firm was his resolution that, until he could feel assured of the fate of one who sang on earth as the angels sing in heaven, he would not eat a mouthful of bread nor drink one drop of water. The tender-hearted scholar-saint fell asleep in his cell, and in his sleep he dreamed a heaven-sent dream. A figure stood by his side and a gentle voice sounded in his ear. Pray for me, pray for me, said the soft far-away voice. Pray for me, Cadoc. Never be weary of praying for me. I shall yet sing eternally the mercy of the Lord. Cadoc had fallen asleep in deepest grief. He awoke joyful and glad. He rejoiced that the good God had heard his prayer. He was filled with happiness when he reflected that henceforward the soul of the poet that he loved would be helped by his daily supplications. For his view of Virgil was that of many another holy man, and with a nineteenth-century poet he would have said, Not for the glittering splendor of the verse, 
O seer singer, do we count thee dear, not for the prowess of the Indian spear, the long brave battling with the Dardan curse, but for thy human heart's sake we rehearse thy deep lines eloquent with hope and fear. Great was the fame of Cadoc in after years, and many the legends of him handed down by his peasant scholars. And on winter nights about the fire when they told the story of Cadoc's book and how the wild wind snatched it from his hold and carried it out to the sea, they knew so well, they never forgot the story's sequel. For, said they, on the following morning the fishermen who reverenced him and loved to offer him the first fruits of their toil brought to his cell a noble salmon in due time the fish was opened within it was found the treasured copy of virgil lost but the day before this in any rate is how they told the story and this is what they believed what is quite certain is that the huge salmon and the recovered Virgil came out of the same sea, and it is more than possible that they were both secured by the same fisherman. Though Cadoc was never again to dwell in his own peaceful domain of Lancarvin, after spending some years upon the little island of Roanoke, he returned to his native land. Much as he dreaded the barbarian Saxons, he thought it his duty to live among them if only to comfort and help the victims of their invasion and at weedon in northamptonshire while he was engaged in singing mass a saxon spear pierced his heart and at the very altar itself he died a blessed martyr end of section thirteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 14 of Meller of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Meller of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages by David Byrne from fold to fold. In the happy far-off times of which we write, high-born boys did not disdain to keep their father's sheep. Seldom was the son of the noble unwilling to act as shepherd lad. The heir to a great estate, sometimes indeed the son of a king, would be met leading his father's flocks to pasture or guarding them from the ravages of wolves and bears. A sturdy, hardy life it was, making for health and beauty and personal bravery, making often enough for learning and piety and for a true estimate of the value of things temporal and eternal. For at that time people were not compelled to consider the cause and cure of something that these days is called civilization. The extravagances and barbiturates, the luxuries and artificialities of our days were happily unknown to men who lived lives that were at once simple and noble, and who died deaths that were not unfrequently blissful and saintly. If an army of writers devoted their time to the study and the relation of all the benefits bestowed upon the world, by the monastic orders and particularly that of saint benedict they would not be able to put on record more than a scanty history of all the known good that these holy monks effected yet in comparison with the unknown how small is known only the angels of god could write the full and complete history of any christian nation happily that which we know is so abundant and leads us into such a labyrinth of golden deeds that we have little need to speculate upon the value of the unrecorded works and words prayers and penances of holy men of old valerie was the son of a gentleman of 
Auvergne. In a strangely varied district he kept his father's sheep, a region of old volcanic caves and exhausted craters now filled with water and forming big circular pools. Yet could Valerie lift his eyes to the blue hills and venture into the deep solitude of vast plain forests, finding abundant pasture for his sheep and learning little by little to love the lonely shepherd life that brought him, as it were, face to face with the Creator? Like many a lad of his own time and later times, he soon began to experience great longings for, he knew not what. The heart of the boy became restless. Big desires possessed him, desires of knowing and of loving the author of all the grandeur that daily greeted his sight. Above all things he desired a knowledge of letters, since this would open out to him all the beauty of the book of nature and the book of the Gospels. Now and then, when he was going home, his father's house after a day's shepherding he would meet boys of his acquaintance returning from the monastery school scarcely could he conceal his envy as he reflected that some of these young nobles and peasants were not older than himself yet easily could they read the written word and recite the whole of the grand primer of ancient times the first serious task every little schoolboy applied himself to the glorious book of a hundred and fifty poems, many of them written by a king who had once been a shepherd boy. But Valerie was still very young. It may be that his father thought there would be ample time for study in the near future. Then the fresh open-air life was so good for the child, already grown ruddy and strong and sturdy, yet in the course of a day's shepherding there was always some unoccupied hours and valerie's father made no objection to his son carrying a tablet and style and since he already knew his alphabet trying to teach himself how to read and write so quite alone and unaided valerie began to trace his letters on the waxen tablet as his sheep browsed peacefully on the mountain side Valerie made symbols of letters and words of syllables. Not content with learning to read and write, the boy now began to study the Latin grammar. One thing he greatly desired, and that was to be able to read, and reading to learn by heart the hymns of the Shepherd King. The multiplication of books has meant certainly the diffusion of knowledge, but also the weakening of memory that a child should learn by heart the entire Psalter and acquire it not merely as a lesson by heart sooner or later to be forgotten, but in order to say and to sing every syllable of it correctly, seems to us something of a feat. Yet for hundreds of years the task was looked upon as a very elementary one and as much a matter of course as the learning of an alphabet. Moreover, in some cases it was done with comparative quickness. The little boy, Lanius, whose good mother brought him to St. Patrick, who asked St. Cassan to take charge of and to instruct him, learned the whole of David's palms in a fortnight. Adabert of Prague learned his Psalter before he was sent to school. How long this task may have occupied Valerie, the shepherd of Auvergne, we do not know, but it is certain that as soon as he could read, and while he kept his sheep, he committed to memory the entire collection of the sacred songs that begin with Betus, Ver, and end with Laudate Donit Deum in Sanctus. What a precious possession for either man or boy! Valerie's delight and thankfulness knew no bounds. Wherever he went, he could build himself a spiritual temple. Every tree became to him a choir stall. The mountainside served him for an oratory. The deep valley was his minster. Going out from home or returning at nightfall, he could chant and sing. In the heat of noontide he could lift heart and voice to God. 
whatever his mood might be this wonderful saltzer supplied him with the words he needed valerie was happier than a regiment of kings the dearest desire of his heart had been satisfied the church's big book of prayers was his more really and more intimately than if he owned the beautifully written psalter lent to him by the abbot of st anthony's prayer was now no difficulty to the boy in one psalm or another the deepest sentiments of his heart could always find expression they were his very own these canticles of praise and of petition these hymns of joy and of sorrow these songs of hope and of love it is any wonder as if one day he chanted the words blessed is he from thou hast chosen and taken to thee he shall dwell in thy courts it is any wonder if he began to think longingly of the abbey of st anthony where his uncle was a monk chosen and taken by god to dwell in his courts valerie was still young and to his father and mother he was exceedingly dear for years perhaps they had noticed the bent of his mind and seen that his affections were set upon things both high and holy to lose him was terrible but they did not oppose his wish to be a monk and after all he was too sweet and gentle too modest and loving to find happiness in a wild lawless world or satisfaction in an inheritance of flocks and herds so on a day that was filled to overflowing with strangely mingled joy and sorrow valerie passed into the silent life of hard study and manual labor and deep prayer as yet he did not go far from home the auvergne that was now and always would be dear to him besides as we have said his own uncle was at st anthony's and it was the most natural thing in the world that valerie should begin his religious apprenticeship among the monks he had so long regarded with affectionate respect here at any rate he spent the time of his noviceship and the years of his early boyhood giving promise of both learning and goodness but in a year or two he went on to the monastery of st onacarius at oxer however the france of those times was full of the report of the wonderful doings of st columbus and the big abbey of luxeuil was attracting to its schools students from every land the fame of the great irish abbot reached the ears of valerie and he began to long to number himself among the monks at Loxio. Staff in hand, and with one companion named Bobo, Valerie left Oxier, and after a toilsome pilgrimage reached that wonderful land of pine forest and blue mountains, which reminded him strongly of his own beloved Auvergne. The novices of Loxil had a garden that was all their own, and of this the holy abbot columbanus made valerie the keeper if the monks had succeeded in nothing but the teaching of the great lesson of the dignity of labor they would have justified their existence in reality they taught their pupils everything that it is good for boy or man to know valerie had come to this far-famed monastery primarily to pray and to study he had also come to work with his hands and how well he tended his enclosed garden is a matter of history so hard did he labor with spade and fork that almost as if by miracle insects and worms stones and weeds seemed to be foreign to his garden to vegetables and to flowers he gave equal care not by bread alone do men live but by every word that is found in god's big book of nature as well as in the precious legacy of his written word brother valerie loved everything that god had made and so assiduously did he cultivate sweet-smelling herbs and every kind of perfumed blossom that what the poet had recorded of arthur's young knight 
Pelis is literally true of Valery. The high doors were softly sundered, and through these a youth. Pelis and the sweet smell of the fields passed, and the sunshine came along with him. For when one day Valery entered the great chapter hall, where the abbot was about to explain the sacred scriptures. The odor of fragrant flowers passed in with him, and before all the assembled monks, Columbanus cried out to the gardener brother, It is thou, my well-beloved, who art the true abbot and lord of this monastery. In kitchen and refractory alike, the vegetables from the novice's garden were in high repute. Ever wholesome and sweet-flavored, said the brother cook, were the cabbages and beans grown by Valerie. Ever pleasant to sight and taste, said the hard-faring monks, were the fruits of the earth that seemed to be endowed with a particular benediction through the prayerful toil of Valerie. Happy were the years spent under the saintly rule of Columbus, so happy indeed and with such practice of solid virtue on the part of the two hundred and twenty monks that the devil became enraged with envy and began to look about him for some means to destroy the blissfulness of such holy living in the person of a woman satan found a ready tool queen bruinholt smote the holy shepherd and scattering the entire flock gave the abbey to seculars happily the havoc wrought by this she-wolf as she was called and her infamous grandson the king of burgundy was ultimately repaired in this work of reparation valerie was prominent joining himself to a saintly father named eustace he began to collect the scattered brethren soon they had the joy of taking possession of the fold that was so dear to them though they never succeeded in recalling their holy abbot content as valerie was to live in monastic peace the heathenist state of some parts of france caused him and a brother named waldenin much grief and soon with the consent of the bishop of amiens and king clothair the third the two monks started on a missionary expedition to Lucane, near the mouth of the Somme. Here they built for themselves a small hermitage and some cells. Little by little, other zealous men joined them, and much encouraged by their bishop, who always came to them for the whole of Lent, a flourishing monastery was established. Its good influence was soon felt throughout the entire district and what had been one of the fastness of satan now became an earthly paradise player valery was to live and to die honored and loved as much by his flock as by his own religious brethren feared too as well as loved for it was firmly believed that he could read the thoughts of the heart had he not openly rebooked a man who had come to receive holy communion after drinking a measure of wine when father valerie's eyes rested upon the boy who brought loaves and some wine his mother had sent as an offering to the monastery church did he not tremble as father valerie said my child you have eaten of the bread offered to god have you not on your way hither did you not drink a quantity of the wine when Valerie broke the pagan images and pulled down little heathen shrines, angry as some of the yet unconverted showed themselves, they dared not lay hand upon the holy man or upon his little acolyte. Yet the fowls of the air had no fear of Valerie's keen and flashing eye. The wild birds not only came and fed from his hand, but would stand on it and permit him to stroke their feathers. So well they recognized him, and so much they sought him, that they would fly into the refractory, well knowing that they would never be driven forth, and that no serving monk would harm them. Yet the master passion of his heart was a great love for the poor, and 
the afflicted and a sentence constantly upon his lips was the more cheerfully we give to those who are in distress the more readily will god give us what we ask of him rose red grew the face of the holy old man as he wandered about the hills of his last resting place on earth rose red with the fire of the love of god which was ever newly kindled when he looked upon and admired the works of the creator long had he read and pondered upon the ever open pages of the book of nature as a little shepherd lad on the hills of Auvergne, he had looked upon the blue mountains and the shining pools set like mirrors in the great stretches of green pasture and he had found them very good long before he could read the written letters upon the borrowed psalter nay before he knew the meaning of the symbols that made up the alphabet he had gazed upon created beauty with the eye of a christian poet and it had led his soul to dwell with ever-increasing fondness upon the uncreated beauty of the divinity one saturday he walked out with a company of his monks and as they climbed a little hill that he had always loved and frequented he paused at the foot of a certain tree and said to his brethren very sweetly my children remember that here is the spot i have chosen for my burial and on the following day the twelfth of december six hundred and twenty two the lord's own day of rejoicing the holy man fell asleep and passed into his everlasting rest like so many other holy monks he gave his name to the town of which his abbey was the beginning st valery sur somme was one of the most prosperous ports of the channel during the middle ages both hugh capet and william the conqueror had great regard for the memory of st valery end of section fourteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section number 15 of Meller of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Meller of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages by David Byrne, Frobert the Simple. 1. At Home Frobert's mother was blind, but for her consolation God sent her Frobert, a child of gentleness and compassionateness. Scarcely could a mother have loved more tenderly. Eyes to the blind, indeed, was Frobert, and a foot to the lame. That this good mother should receive her sight was the daily prayer of the child then this he had no other temporal blessing to ask of heaven he was not as other children by nature he was gentle and loving and his mother's affliction had kept him by her side making him thoughtful beyond his years and causing him to move about gently to speak softly making him prayerful too beyond the wont of children who have lately come to the use of reason and the prayerfulness made him holy so frobert lived his child life devoted to his mother for her own sake and for god's sake devoted to god above all things it was no wonder that he shrank from the rough play of the street and that he cared so little for what gives pleasure to the average child in the eyes of the boisterous and the rough he was a simpleton they did not understand that nature and the circumstances of his life had made him gentle and gracious and that grace acting upon nature had made him saintly to the rough and the rude he was frobert the simpleton to his poor blind mother he was the very joy of life he lived in the lone west country of france 
where the mountains of the Vosges begin their formidable range, and where the heavy snows of winter are now followed with a wealth of wild cherry blossom that keeps the hills white with flowers when they cease to be white with snow. And he lived in the far-off times of the seventh century, when England had just been converted, and when our country had no church or religious house comparable with the Abbey of Luxeuil, which was the glory of the neighborhood in which Frobert lived. A wild period it certainly was, although the light of faith was burning brightly enough in western France. A wild country, too, where the winter lasted long and the wolves ran through the streets of the little towns at the foot of the Vosges. A perilous journey was it to the bishop's school, sometimes an impossible one, but for all his gentleness the boy was hardy and courageous. A perilous journey was it to the bishop's school, sometimes an impossible one, but for all his gentleness the boy was hardy and courageous, and indeed his goodness and purity made him brave. An apt scholar, too, he showed himself with a special taste for all holy learning and a very marked preference for the sacred books. Doubtless, even as a young boy, the Bishop of Troyes had heard of his goodness and his dogged application to his work, for it was to the prelate's own school that Frobert was sent. But to leave the poor blind mother day by day was a sore trial to the boy, and he determined that if earnest and persistent prayer could bring about a miracle, as indeed it had often done, that prayer should not be wanting. So day by day Frobert applied himself to his work with all the energy he possessed. Day by day he implored the good God to look with pity upon his mother's affliction and to restore her sight. For how long he prayed, we are not told. But on a day never to be forgotten, while he was standing by the loving woman's side receiving the motherly caresses she so often bestowed upon him, suddenly he threw his arms about her and tenderly kissed her sightless eyes. Then, full of confidence in the power and pity of Jesus Christ, who once gave sight to the blind, Frobert made the sign of the cross on his mother's eyes, and a paroxysm of prayer implored the help of heaven. The petition of this pure-souled child was heard. His mother received her sight. Frobert was the holy child of a holy mother. What could she offer to God in thanksgiving for one of the greatest temporal favors it is possible for a human being to receive? Well, just at that particular time, God asked for no great sacrifice in return. The day came, however, when he demanded nothing less than the son she loved so fondly. For, as time went on, it became more and more clear that Frobert had a call to the life of religion. No greater sacrifice could have been asked of this good mother, a woman poor in this world's goods, and, as far as we know, having no other son to work for her, yet freely and generously she gave her child to God. 2. In the Cloister So the doors of the great abbey of Luxil were opened to Frobert still a boy of tender years. Both for mother and son the wrench was a terrible one. Frobert had need now for all the courage which is ever the outcome of genuine piety. He had left a poor but very happy home and a mother who lived him tenderly, to live in a great monastery where there were six hundred monks, besides a great band of boy pupils chiefly the sons of French nobles. Founded only some thirty years ago or before the birth of Frobert by that amazing and intrepid Irish missionary St. Columban, the Abbey of Luxeuil was at this time the very head 
and center of all intellectual life in France. It was protected by her kings, and it gave the church her bishops. From its walls went forth many a band of holy monks to preach the faith in dark and savage places, and many were the religious houses that sprang from it and followed the Columban rule. Not less than 105 monasteries were founded by the disciples of St. Columban in France, Germany, Switzerland, and Italy. Beautiful and holy as the life was in Luxel, we can well understand the bewilderment of Frobert when he first found himself walking its crowded cloisters. Though he had done well at the bishop's school and gave promise of becoming a scholar, he seemed to have entered this severe order as a lay brother. Severe indeed was the rule as laid down by St. Columban. But this great man had passed away, and the existing abbot appears to have been as kind and sympathetic as he was zealous and holy. Yet the young novice must have shuddered when he heard of the painful penances accepted by his brothers what seemed to us very trifling faults. The six lashes inflicted upon those who did not answer amen at grace the same for talking in the refractory or for smiling in church, the fifty lashes for such greater faults as willful disobedience and insubordination. Nay, there were offenses for which the penance was two hundred strokes, and it would be slight consolation to a boy to know that only twenty-five were ever administered at one time. But we must remember that St. Columban had had to deal with a great body of men, many of whom were barely civilized, men who had everything to unlearn and much to learn, nor must we forget that we are reading of a period more than three hundred years before the Norman conquest. The marvel is that so many of these monks were such holy and learned men that they were both there is abundant and clear historical proof. But we need not be surprised if we find that there was a brother here and there not quite so thoughtful and considerate as we might expect a monk to be. For Burr was simple with the beautiful simplicity that belongs to some characters, and which seems to have very little to do with the absence of intelligence. He was one of those lovable people that men are inclined to laugh at, not by any means in an unkindly way, but because their sense of humor is greater than that of their victim. Sometimes, indeed, the laughter is altogether a kindly nature and, like Dickens' delightful Tom Pinch, the person who provoked it is greatly loved. Frobert was, in some respects, a Tom Pinch of the seventh century. To begin with, he was very ignorant of the world of men, and never suspected that there were people who would take advantage of his ignorance. Even the world of the cloister was to him a new and surprising world, and he saw and heard of many things the very names of which he did not know. Perhaps he had already made some amusing mistakes, and was getting a reputation for the comical little errors that provoke laughter. Anyhow, he was one day made the subject of a very thoughtless, practical joke. There was a visitor in the abbey at that time, a certain religious man named Tudolin, who had come to Luxil for purposes of study and Brother Forbear was appointed to attend upon him. The goodness of his young servant was, no doubt, fully appreciated by the stranger, yet he could not, or rather did not, resist the temptation to have a little fun at Frobert's expense. Perhaps we shall be inclined to smile when we are told that Frobert did not know a pair of compasses when he saw them. But again, we must remember the period and the fact that the school apparatus of the time was very primitive. Tudolin, then, 
sent the boy to another monk to ask for a pair of compasses and the brother to whom the novice was sent suspecting the nature of the errand took up a couple of stones from a hand mill that was lying near and put them round frobert's neck obediently enough the boy tried to carry the compasses to tudolan's cell though the weight of them was almost more than he could support staggering along the cloister and trying to ease the weight upon his neck by holding the stones in his hands for burr suddenly came face to face with his abbot in sheer compassion the superior stopped to ask the lad where he was going very simply for burr explained that he was taking a pair of compasses to the visitor who wanted them for literary purposes removing the millstones from the boy's neck the abbot burst into tears grieved to the heart that the simple lad should have been made a fool of by those who had every opportunity of knowing his goodness the rebuke administered to tudolan and the other monk was a sharp one and it is very unlikely that they ever played any other practical joke upon Frobert. But in spite of this little matter and the undoubted hardness of the life, the young novice was entirely happy, for he possessed within himself the secret of happiness, a pure heart and a clear conscience. Moreover, he knew that he had been called to this holy state of life and that he was doing the will of God in all things three at the bishop's house being beloved to god it was necessary that frobert should be tried and the trial came to him in a particularly unwelcome form how long he had been at the abbey when his old friend the bishop of troyes called him from the cloister we are not told but we may be sure that the boy had finished the term of his noviceship and he was looking forward to a peaceful if toilsome life within the dearly loved walls of luxil but the good bishop had not forgotten the gentle and modest little lad who had once sat in the cathedral school the prelate liked to have holy people about him moreover he saw great possibilities in this young pheasant boy so much as it cost him frobert willingly obeyed and passed from the peaceful cloister to the house of the bishop in the city of troyes but he did not cease to live as a monk hard as he found it to keep his rule and to follow the daily practices of the dear order amid his new surroundings he relaxed nothing in the austere mode of living prescribed by st the bishop's servants did not approve of his austerities and when lent came and frobert ate nothing until after sunset they became downright angry then some of them started a story that the young monk was a humbug and that his pretense of fasting till evening was all nonsense they said this to the bishop adding that brother frobert kept a supply of food in his chamber and ate secretly probably the bishop did not believe them but he thought it only right to submit frobert to some little test so to the lad's surprise his lordship told him that he could change his room and move into a little cell in the cathedral tower frobert was delighted for he was now somewhat nearer to god's altar and the tower chamber though rather cold and desolate was very quiet and peaceful but he could not for some time understand why the bishop so constantly looked in upon him at meal times for example and indeed at all sorts of extraordinary hours however his lordship was soon satisfied that frobert had no store of provisions and that his lenten fast was no pretense so somewhat to his regret Frobert left his chamber in the tower only to find that the bishop wished him to prepare himself for sacred orders. 4. In After Years 
for bert's great wish was to be hidden and unknown but it seems as though the more he withdrew himself from public life the more he was sought after he could not even escape the notice of the emperor not only in the city of troyes but throughout the land the fame of his holiness and his miracles began to spread the good bishop soon saw that almighty god had some great work for the young monk to do this work was nothing less than founding of a new monastery on land given to him for the purpose by clovis the second frobert built the famous monastery la salle thus the monk who had once been regarded as a simpleton became one of the most remarkable abbots of his time and ruled a community largely made up of scholars for many long years he lived a holy and happy life at la salle spending his last days in the building of a handsome church his strength seems to have lasted as long as a church was in progress when it was finished he knew that he had not long to live it was near christmas and the abbot's great desire was to see the church consecrated on the feast of the nativity but the bishop could not well leave his cathedral on so great a day and frobert prayed earnestly that his life might be prolonged until the octave day of christmas his prayer was answered when on the first of january the building had been solemnly dedicated to god quietly and happily the abbot passed away end of section fifteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section number sixteen of meller of the silver hand and other stories of the bright ages this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c meller of the silver hand and other stories of the bright ages by david byrne sheer pluck one if the world has an esteem for any particular virtue that virtue is fortitude under the name of pluck every man admires this quality and loves to see it in action it appeals to men of every class to the old as much as to the young to women as well as to men a lack of this virtue is peculiarly humiliating both to man and boy possession of it in any uncommon degree raises the individual to the rank of a hero st thomas tells us that we may regard fortitude in two ways one as meaning of a certain firmness of mind and purpose two as signifying firmness in the enduring and resisting of those difficulties in which it is hardest to have firmness fortitude then is a certain moral strength or courage unyielding courage in the endurance of pain and adversity with physical or structural strength it has nothing to do the use of the latin fortitude in connection with bodily strength is very rare its employment in english is the same sense is said to be obsolete as one of the four cardinal virtues it is therefore strength or firmness of mind or soul which enables a person to do and to dare to suffer and to endure without murmurs or complaint or depression it is the foundation of the source and basis of all courage and bravery of all patience in suffering of all forbearance and magnanimity in one word it is manliness the principal act of fortitude is endurance says st thomas and he defines endurance as the remaining steady and unflinching in dangers rather than attacking endurance is more difficult than taking the offensive he tells us 
to attack another supposes that we have the upper hand if we are attacked the opponent is probably the stronger again endurance supposes a long time but one may attack by a sudden movement it is harder to remain long immovable than with a sudden motion to move forward to an arduous task to prove that mere physical courage is vastly inferior to fortitude is unnecessary the task will be like the flogging of a dead ass perhaps only a very small boy or a very foolish man has ever ventured to deny that the ruling of oneself is harder and braver thing than the taking of a strong city nevertheless in the minds of many there is a lamentable tendency to confuse animal courage with moral bravery and to prefer a spirit of mere brutal combativeness to that grand endurance of pain and suffering which can alone raise a man to the rank of the truly heroic disgusted with lifelong reading of the lives of men who became less heroic the more he knew of them edward fitzgerald exclaimed i think there is but one hero and that is the maker of heroes we may applaud the sentiment even while we point out that if the incarnate god is the maker of heroes those heroes have lived or are living know you not that the saints shall judge this world asked st paul of the Corinthians, and he reminds the thessalonians of the coming of our lord jesus christ with all his saints and again that he shall come to be glorified in his saints there never was a saint who was not also a hero but of how few of these heroes so called whose names are honored by the world can we say that they were in any degree saintly to set forth the lives of the saints of god merely as so many examples of fortitude as so many models of pluck would be an easy and grateful task but it would scarcely give us a complete portrait of these true heroes of earth and heaven for the topmost thing about them is their love of god above all things their love of the neighbor for god's sake self-love the universal vice selfishness in every form self-interest self-pity self-complacency self-conceit self-seeking self-enjoyment self-pleasing self-consciousness self-exaltation self-deceit self-will self-esteem self-indulgent each and every one of these bad qualities was met and fought and done to death by the saints of god they are saints just because they were not lovers of self they were canonized not so much because of the external wonders they wrought nor because of the miracles they performed but precisely because they loved god and their neighbor in a degree that was in every sense of the word heroic two among the many early saints who are renowned for their courage the young simon stylates is a magnificent example born in the year 390 he lived in sison a little town in cilicia on the borders of syria his father was a poor shepherd and like joseph and david the boy looked after his father's sheep one day in the depth of winter when it was impossible to lead the sheep to pasture the young simon went to assist at the offices of the church whither he heard the beatitudes read and commented upon the first time we are not told but it is certain that their meaning came home to him that day with great force 
Blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the clean of heart. These in particular struck the thirteen-year-old boy and made him thoughtful. He could not be happy until he had asked a certain old man to expound the meaning of these moving words of Christ, and when he understood them he begged to be told how the promised blessedness could be obtained. Doubtless it was pointed out to him that every Christian had the choice of two roads, that of the precepts and that of the counsels. One was harder and narrower and more toilsome than the other, but it was safer and better for those who were called by God to enter upon it, and was for them the high road to happiness and to perfection. Then Simon began to pray, and his prayer was not hurried recital of an Our Father or Hail Mary. He was brave and fearless, this young shepherd lad, and he was determined to listen to the voice of God. In secret he prayed as though life itself depended upon his prayer. Prostrate on the ground he implored God to guide and enlighten him. Exhausted, perhaps, by the length and vehemence of his prayer, he fell asleep, and in his sleep he was permitted to see a vision. The lad dreamed that he was digging, digging deeply for the foundations of a house. Toiling hard, he was compelled to stop now, and then in order to take a breath. Four times, he afterwards said, did he rest for an instant and each time he distinctly heard a voice calling to him and saying, Dig deeper. At length he was told to cease. The pit was deep enough for the foundation of whatever structure he cared to raise upon it. The event, says an ancient writer, verified the prediction. The afterlife of this wonderful loud was so superior to nature that it might well require the deepest possible foundation of humility and fever. Not far from his father's house there was a monastery under the care of a holy abbot named Timothy. Rising from sleep, Simon betook himself to the gate of this religious house. Though not the only way by which perfection may be reached, the boy knew that the monastic life was the best and readiest means of attaining such an end. Yet his humility did not permit him to ask for the religious habit. To be the drudge of the servants of the servants of God was his only aspiration at the time. For several days and nights he lay prostrate at the gate without taking either food or drink, begging that he might be admitted as the lowest of the hired servants of the abbot. His request was eventually granted, and for four months, with great fever and affection, he undertook the meanest offices of the abbey. It would almost appear that during these months he was regarded as a novice, at any rate as a postulant, for it is expressly said of him that he undertook the first task of a novice, not imposed in primitive times only, but still enjoined in some of the ancient religious orders, the learning by heart of the 150 Psalms of David. What a precious possession for a young mind! The entire Psalter committed to memory, every one of those priceless hymns ready to pass from mind to lips at any moment of the day or night. In this monastery Simon remained for two years, ever advancing in love and humility and gaining the esteem and good will of his older religious brethren. Whether the boy monk now wished to place himself at a greater distance from home or parents, or whether he wished to join a stricter community, we are not told. But at the age of fifteen, Simon passed to the monastery of Helidorus, an 
an abbot of great sanctity who had passed sixty-two of the sixty-five years of his life in this community it is now that the lad began that wonderful life of mortification which in an age and in a part of the world where penance and fasting were very ordinary matter-of-fact occurrences made simon stellites renowned we must not forget who and what he was as a poor shepherd boy he had lived a simple open-air life and his food had always been the food of the poor doubtless his frame was a sturdy one and his constitution vigorous and healthy we know not what his particular reason may have been for eating but once a week we know nothing of his interior trials and temptations we know too that fasting is but a means to an end and that perfection does not consist in afflicting the body no one knew this better than simon himself but he loved god above all things and he wanted to prove his love let it be frankly admitted that at this time of his life he made mistakes but better than all the penances and fastings and mortifications was the obedience he showed to his superior Helidorius forbade him to fast for so long a time and simon at once yielded only, however, to fall into an indiscretion of another kind. 3. It may be that fierce temptations afflicted the pure soul of this growing boy, and that he was heroically determined to overcome them at any cost. Round and round his body, next to the skin, he bound a rough, thick, well rope, made of the big, hard-twisted leaves of the psalm tree he did this unknown to his superior or to any of his brethren that this instrument of penance caused him great suffering is certain the rope began to eat into his flesh and a terrible abscess was the result a physician had to be called in to cut the cords he was compelled to make incisions in the flesh and these nearly cost the patient his life for three days liquids had to be applied to soften the shreds of clothing that clung to the wound and it is said that for some time the boy lay as though he were dead but he recovered only to be dismissed from the monastery let this not be forgotten simon had erred and the error cost him very dearly his abbot regarded such conduct as a dangerous singularity prejudicial to true religious discipline and he would have none of it and remember this abbot was a man of singular holiness and one who for many years had led a life of great mortification it is not clear for how long a time simon remained under the care of abbot helidorius but at the time of his dismissal the saint was probably only a boy sadly wandering away from the monastery he came in contact with a holy priest named bassus and at the foot of mount telnician or thelonicia he began to lead the life of a hermit the abbot bassus he had two hundred monks in his charge became simon's director the boy was determined now to act only under obedience, and at the beginning of Lent, when he asked permission to abstain from all food and drink during the entire forty days, the abbot gave him ten loaves of bread and a supply of water, charging him to eat if he found it necessary. Coming to him at Easter with the most blessed sacrament, Bassus found the young hermit stretched upon the ground, apparently dead. The loaves and the water had not been touched. Reviving him a little by moistening his lips with a sponge, the priest gave him holy communion. A little later Simon broke his fast upon lettuce leaves and herbs. In 
this hermitage he spent three years and then built for himself at the top of the mountain not a hut not even a shed but a sort of wall a roofless screen that afforded him little or no shelter from the cold of the mountain top then lie then he had an iron ring riveted around his right leg and connected by a great chain to the rock upon which he lived among those who visited him at this time was Meltius, vicar of the patriarch of Anatoc, who told him that a firm will and grace of God would keep him to his purpose without the wearing of a fetter. At once the obedient Simon sent for a smith and had the shackle removed. And now the saint's troubles began. Day after day the mountain was thronged with the crowds who came to him to be cured of their diseases, to listen to his exhortations, or to receive his blessing. The distraction caused by these visits to a man whose only longing was to be alone with God may be imagined. For the next thirty-seven years of his life he lived on pillars, beginning with a column of stones six cubits high. After four years he raised a second one of twelve cubits. Three years later he built another one, twenty-two cubits in height, and remained upon it for ten years. But for the last twenty years of his life he lived upon a pillar built for him by the people, a column that reached the height of forty cubits. Thus he was to be known in history as the Stellites, from the Greek stylos, a pillar. Tennyson's poem on the saint is known to all English speaking readers. It is in many respects an exceedingly fine piece of verification, but it gives us an absurdly imperfect portrait of St. Simon. Like most Protestant readers, and perhaps a few unthinking Catholic ones, Lord Tennyson misses the secret of the hermit's sanctity and the leading characteristic of the saint's life. Some portions of the long soliloquy that the poet puts into Simon's mouth are impossible, yet the late laureate had evidently studied his subject with care and tried to treat it sympathetically. The refrain of this poetical monologue is indeed exactly what we might expect from a saint. Have mercy, Lord, and take away my sin. This was undoubtedly the burden of St. Simon's prayer. But a poet who could put the following into the mouth of Stylites proves that he read the lives of the saints to little purpose. O Jesus, if thou wilt not save my soul, who may be saved? Who is it may be saved? Who may be be made a saint if I fail here? Nor would Simon in his prayer make a catalogue of the penances he had practiced since boyhood. For not alone this pillar punishment, not this alone I bore, but while I lived in this white convent down the valley there, for many weeks about my loins I wore the ropes that hauled the buckets from the well, twisted as tight as I could not the noose, and spoke not of it to a single soul, until the ulcer eating through my skin betrayed my secret penance, so that all my brethren marveled greatly. More than this I bore, whereof, O God, thou knowest all. We have already pointed out that for this particular indiscretion the young monk was dismissed from his white convent, and we may be quite sure that afterwards he bitterly regretted the not speaking to a single soul of such self-inflicted punishment, even though he might be conscious of having had a good intention in the matter, he would certainly not look back upon it with complacency or offer to Almighty God a singularity that, 
for the time at least, deprived him of his vocation. Tennyson was a great poet, and there are some wonderful lines in his St. Simon Stylites. But the laureate's grasp of the principles of the Catholic faith and practice was always a very loose one. It can never be repeated too often that mortification is not in itself sanctity, that itself is not the quality that raises a man to the altars of the church. Sometimes it is a contributing cause to holiness of life. Sometimes it is the natural effect of an overpowering love of God. Such mortifications as these of the stylites are not only imitable, but they are not the actions that make him dear to the Catholic heart. That his penances were truly heroic, and that as an example of fortitude he is wonderful even among the saints may be granted, but his claim upon our love and veneration comes precisely through his ready obedience, his profound humility, and his perfect charity. Bidden to descend from his pillar, twice every day he preached to the people, and his influence for good seems to have been almost unbounded. Not merely Christians, but pagans and barbarians crowded to hear him. We read of an entire nation being converted to the faith through his sermons and miracles. Persians, Armenians, and Iberians made long pilgrimages to hear him. Emperors, kings, and queens came to consult him. The Empress Eudoxia was rescued by him from the hearsay of Eutychius. The Empire Marcan came to him disguised as a poor pilgrim. Solitary as he was, St. Simon did not live for himself alone. Happy were they for whom he prayed, and blessed was she who bore him. For we are told by a disciple of his that after his mother's death the saint's prayers for her were most fervent ever regarding himself as the vilest of sinners and the outcast of the world his charity and sweetness to others had no limit he was always ready to submit himself to ecclesiastical authority and the fact that the patriarch of antonic and other prelates and priests were willing to mount the columns in order to give him holy communion shows that his manner of life was blessed by god and approved by the church he died in four hundred and fifty nine in the sixty ninth year of his age end of section sixteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c Section 17 of Melor of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Melor of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages by David Byrne. The Story of Ephraim. In Nisibis, sixteen hundred years ago, lived a lad named Ephraim. He was the son of poor parents who were good Catholics, and who had indeed suffered much for the faith, for they lived in the terrible times of the Emperor Diocletian, and the wonder is that they are known only as confessors and not as martyrs. Their son gave them much trouble. The wrath of his high spirits is his ruin, says Ecclesiasticus there is danger in mere high-spiritedness unless it is kept in check by prayer and sacraments in itself it is a lovable quality enough and one that joined to the fear of god is likely to result in something very good the light-heartedness of the saints 
is a proverb but high spirits in conjunction with a fiery and passionate temper and a careless heedless disposition is bound to bring a man into great trouble sometimes to irretrievable ruin ephraim's high spirits were of this description laziness opens the door to every kind of sin and he seems to have been incurably idle ripe for mischief of every kind was ephraim for if he was sent on an errand by his parents he acted like the young man in the parable saying i go sir although he only made a pretense of going he had some knowledge of the catholic faith but according to the customs of the age and the place his baptism had been put off at first sight stone throwing on the part of a country boy does not seem a very serious matter though when it is recklessly continued it may lead to very sad results wanton cruelty is quite another matter and when we hear of ephraim setting to work deliberately to stone a cow that was in calf and continuing this until the poor beast fell dead we feel that unpromising material is a very mild term to apply to him the day upon which this happened he had been sent by his parents on an errand to a neighbouring town and it was on his way out that the boy seems to have stoned the cow to death spending hours at the task for he drove it before him into a thick wood and it was sunset before the animal expired during the night it was eaten by wild beasts returning home the next day ephraim met on the road the poor man who owned the cow not suspecting that it was dead but knowing something of the lad's character the man asked him if he had driven the animal away the only answer the poor fellow got was a torrent of abuse congratulating himself upon his escape from what might have been a serious charge for the syrian law in regard to property was a severe one ephraim was again sent out of town on some business for his parents in passing through the wood he came across some shepherds who proved such good company that he loitered with them until nightfall it was too late then to continue his journey and so he stayed with them all night when morning came there was a great to-do during the night the fold had been broken into and some valuable sheep carried off that ephraim was in league with the robbers they never doubted they thought that he had got up in the night and shown the way to the thieves pointing out the best and fattest sheep the boy protested and swore and cried but they would not listen to him prison said they was the only place for him and to prison they dragged him now in the matter of sheep stealing a crime for which men in our country were hanged not so many years ago ephraim was entirely innocent and when he found himself locked up he began to cry very bitterly there was no one to help him no one to pity him it was his first experience of prison life and he found it painful and yet there was worse to follow to lie all day on this little heap of straw with heavy irons locked on his ankles was bad enough but what of the trial that awaited him boy as he was he had heard much of the awful tortures that were inflicted upon prisoners in the courts of that still pagan country of the sentences of lifelong slavery of fearful mutilation and of terrible modes of execution in a land that was still heathen mercy was almost unknown and ephraim had not the smallest reason for hoping that his tender age would be a plea for pity he knew that boys as young as himself even younger had been condemned to die on the gibbet for breaking the laws of their country that some indeed had suffered the fearful death of crucifixion the boy was not alone in his gloomy prison two men awaiting trial lay in chains in the same vault as himself both were accused of serious crimes and both declared that they were innocent well, this struck ephraim as being very curious and he began to think about it a good deal of the crime with which he was charged he knew himself to be innocent was it possible that his fellow prisoners were equally guiltless one night he dreamed a dream 
he thought that some very noble-looking person came to his side and said to him ephraim why are you in prison at once the boy began to declare his innocence yes said the shining figure you are innocent of the crime of which you are accused but what of the poor man's cow that you drove to its death be quite sure that no one suffers without reason and as a proof of this when morning comes listen to the talk of your fellow prisoners on the following day the two men spoke together and one of them who was charged with murder said to the other i declare that i am not guilty of taking away the life of a fellow creature but i will tell you of a vile thing i did only the other day as i was passing over a bridge i came upon two men quarrelling one of them at last took hold of the other and threw him into the river now if i had tried i believe i could have saved that man unhappily i did not and the poor fellow was drowned then to the utter astonishment of the boy the other man began to make a somewhat similar confession i am absolutely innocent of the thing for which i am awaiting my trial nevertheless i have done something which is very bad a certain neighbor of mine when he was dying left his property to be divided between his daughter and his two sons the young men wanted everything for themselves and they bribed me to give false evidence by which the will was upset and the poor girl was deprived of her share for nearly six weeks went by before ephraim and his two companions were brought to trial the men were tried first but the boy prisoner was in court during the whole time neither of the men would confess were they not both innocent and to the lad's great horror the rack was brought in the men were stripped and fastened to it hand and foot an awful terror came upon the boy as he saw his fellow prisoners stretched out upon the instrument of torture and his cries filled the hall but the officers of the court and the people who were standing about were merely amused by his evident fright and gave him the coldest of all cold comfort what are you crying for lad they asked him it's of no use howling now you should have thought of the rack before you stole the sheep you're bound to get a taste of it very soon the boy was really half dead with the anticipation of the torture that was before him and it seems probable that he swooned away from sheer fright happily for his companions before their case was finished both of them were able to prove their innocence and so they were set at liberty but there was no time left that day for the trying of ephraim and he was taken back to prison in a few days he found himself with three companions in irons instead of the two who had been released and curiously enough the new prisoners turned out to be the two brothers who had defrauded their sister out of her property and the man who had thrown his enemy into the river and so with these undesirable criminals ephraim lay in prison for another six long weeks a wretched time it must have been for the boy with the terror of the torture still hanging over him as well as the trial at which it seemed quite possible that he would not be able to prove his innocence of the robbery it is no wonder that he began to pray though still unbaptized his good catholic parents the very thought of whom was an agony to him as he lay in prison had carefully instructed him in the christian faith and like many another poor sinner now that he found himself in serious trouble he turned his thoughts to god he could not but feel that there was a certain fitness in his punishment and yet the horror of the rack was naturally enough strongly upon him and with all his might he prayed god to have pity at length the day came when the prisoners were chained together and brought to the place of trial again the grown-up criminals were examined first and again that terrible rack was brought into operation but this time the men were found guilty and after being severely racked were sentenced to lose their right hands ephraim's turn had now come questioned by the judge the young prisoner declared that he was innocent this is the plea of every criminal said the judge here take and strip him and fasten him on the rack 
more dead than alive the unhappy boy was stripped of his clothing and was about to have his hands and feet lashed to the wooden rollers of the rack when a servant entered the court and told the judge that it was dinner time and that his meal was ready and waiting very well replied the judge in that case i will try this boy some other day take him back to jail and so the lad escaped the rack this time also in the extremity of his terror he had made a vow that if only god would deliver him from the punishment he dreaded so much he would become a monk well he had been delivered that day just in the nick of time in a most sudden and unexpected manner but what of the dreaded future it seemed likely that that awful dislocation of his young limbs had only been put off to an unknown day happily for ephraim for this third trial he had not long to wait it is probable that some good-hearted officer reminded the court of the length of time the boy had been in prison at any rate the judge thought that he had been punished quite enough and to his intense joy his shackles were removed and he was set at liberty what think you did the boy ephraim do as soon as he found himself free did he go back home to his parents stoning cattle by the way and stopping to play with every shepherd lad he met by no means everybody knows the old couplet beginning the devil was sick the devil a monk would be and it is certain that many promises are made to god in times of sickness or peril that are not fulfilled in seasons of health and safety but ephraim had taken a vow and he intended to keep it he knew that in the mountains not far off there lived an old hermit and to this holy man he would offer himself as a novice it seems at first sight that for such a life no lad could have been less fitted probably he himself doubted very much if the hermit would accept him however he had made a vow and he would do his best to fulfil it he was not ignorant of the kind of life that he would be called upon to live and yet hard as the monastic rule might be he did not shrink from it hands and brain would both be fully employed and his food would be of the scantiest but god had delivered him from prison and from torture and ephraim must needs prove his gratitude the sufferings of the last three months had made him thoughtful if an earthly prison was so gloomy what would hell be like if the pain of the rack was so much to be dreaded what of the punishment in that place of endless torment the saintly old man to whom he went did not refuse to receive him in good earnest ephraim began to engage in two of the healthiest exercises known to man prayer and work he became a sailmaker at the same time he began to use his head through no fault of his parents his education had been neglected and he had everything to learn but he was in earnest and when man or boy begins to put forth the full strength of his will and the energies a good god had given him there is not much that he cannot do certainly ephraim did wonders there was that bad temper of his to control and to subdue and like the sensible fellow he was he began with that the notable thing about this lad was his great earnestness god had been good to him ephraim was bent upon proving his gratitude sorrow for sin became his chief exercise he was determined to repair the past but he had not withdrawn himself from the world in order to lead an idle life brain and hand were now fully occupied and he was earning the bread he ate in this way he bade farewell to idleness for evermore for the rest had he not put himself under the obedience of a holy and experienced abbot and is not everything possible to the obedient no boy no man becomes a saint in a day naturally bad-tempered he had to struggle hard with his irritability and ill-humour the point is that he did struggle and that every such struggle however unsuccessful it might seem to be was a victory once after he had fasted for several days and was just going to sit down to a mess of herb pottage 
the brother who was carrying the bowl let it fall well said ephraim cheerfully to the rueful looking monk if the pot won't come to me i must go to it and so he took his seat on the floor and picked up what he could from the broken basin ephraim's baptism made him a new creature the past was forgiven the sins of his youth were washed away grace was offered to him and he accepted it fervently and thankfully used it determinedly and assiduously henceforth he was all for god his was no half conversion applying himself to manual labor and at the same time exercising his memory by learning the whole of the psalter he gave himself generously to the duties of his vocation it was soon discovered that his abilities were of a high order and his superiors encouraged him in the study of philosophy and theology after long preparation ephraim obtained leave to go to edessa in order to hold conference with certain holy hermits who lived in the mountains close to that city and here he remained receiving the holy order of deacon he began to preach and his incredible fervor and zeal bore immense fruit he who in his own life was such a wonderful example of penitence won from god the great gift of touching the hearts of sinners and numerous were the souls that he brought to christ he was possessed of an extraordinary faculty of natural eloquence words flowed from him like a torrent which yet were too slow for the impetuosity and multitude of thoughts with which he was overwhelmed in speaking on spiritual subjects his conceptions were always clear his diction pure and agreeable he spoke with admirable perspicuity copiousness and sententiousness in an easy unaffected style and with so much sweetness so pathetic a vehemence so natural an accent and so strong emotions of his own heart that his words seemed to carry with them an irresistible power but he did not confine himself to preaching to the glory of god and for the good of souls he began to use his pen though ignorant of greek he was a perfect master of syriac and in this language he wrote what may almost be described as a library of ascetical and theological books heaven had endowed him with a great gift of poetry and this he used with the utmost skill to increase the knowledge and love of the redeemer wonderful is the beauty and sweetness of his poems on the nativity of our lord and on the mysteries of religion and perhaps no poet has ever written more eloquently or more worthily than ephraim on the dignity and holiness of our blessed lady some of the heretics of his time the manichees the millenarians and the marionites had spread their errors by means of songs and hymns for these ephraim substituted many beautiful compositions of his own to the great spiritual gain of the people of edessa if the life of saint ephraim for saint we must now call him were not so well authenticated and if so many of his writings were not in evidence we might indeed hesitate to believe that the more than unpromising material of his boyhood could have been moulded to the shape of a doctor and the father of the catholic church and of one of the greatest masters of the spiritual life in the fourth century it is true that the early life of this saint is told in different ways by different authors and this is easily accounted for ephraim himself frequently related the story of it to his monks and as often happens in such cases in writing it down they were not all equally accurate even the erudite alban buckler gives a version which in some of its items does not tally with the more detailed and critical work of the bolandists indeed it seems as though father butler thought that saint ephraim exaggerated the wildness and sinfulness of his youth though this learned hagiologist admits the stone-throwing episode the false accusation of sheep-stealing and the boy's subsequent imprisonment and trial but from the long and copious records of the acta sanctorium it is clear enough that whatever many other men may have been ephraim the syrian was not a saint from his cradle 
he may not have been a monster of iniquity but it is certain enough that he gave no promise of sanctity probably indeed of all the boys in his neighborhood he was the least likely to distinguish himself either for learning or holiness in short he is a marvelous example of a sinner who sincerely repents asks for receives and uses the grace that god is always ready to give to those who really seek it more than that he is an example of one who in the beginning turned to our lord from the motive of fear it was sheer fright the abject terror of the rack that first made ephraim cry mightily to heaven so there was nothing very noble nothing in any way heroic in the beginning of this wonderful change of life happily that which began in fear was continued in contrition and ended in love his deep sorrow for sin made him very dear to god his soul was that of a true penitent of one who walks humbly and proceeds cautiously who has no trust in himself but an unbounded confidence in god in the beginning of his conversion probably the last thing he thought of was that he would ever be able to minister to others it seems almost certain that his humility prevented him from receiving the priesthood and that like saint benedict and saint francis he remained a deacon to the end of his life he loved solitude and after a term of preaching would retire into the desert to refresh his own soul with prayer and meditation yet he was always at the call of duty and showed his readiness to benefit the bodies of the people as well as their souls once when the city of edessa was severely visited by famine st ephraim boldly rebuked the callousness of the rich for allowing the poor to die unsuccored your wealth will be your damnation he said to those who were heedless of their obligation in performing works of mercy frightened and ashamed they pretended that there was no one to whom they could entrust the proper distribution of their alms then give me that office said the saint as soon as he had received sufficient money old as he was at the time he fitted up no less than three hundred beds in the public hospitals and began to tend the sick and the starving with his own hands it was the last public undertaking of his long and useful life it was as though the great god had kept him alive until the cessation of the famine for when his services were no longer needed he returned to his cell and died after a few days sickness at the time of his death which took place about the year three seventy eight saint ephraim had reached a very advanced age but the date of his birth is not known ancient writers tell us that he was very tall and that his countenance was singularly sweet and beautiful in his old age he stooped considerably and though his eyes were often swimming with tears his features were wonderfully calm and serene his devotion to the adorable sacrament was very great and among the last words that he wrote we find the following entering upon so long and dangerous a journey i have my viaticum even thee o son of god in my extreme spiritual hunger i will feed on thee the repairer of mankind so it shall be that no fire will dare to approach me for it will not be able to bear the sweet saving odour of thy body and blood with his last breath he preached and the entire population of the city crowded to the door of his cell forbidding every kind of funeral pomp he again and again begged prayers for the repose of his soul and then turning to god in silent prayer he gently passed away End of section seventeen. Section eighteen of Melor of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Melor of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages by David Byrne. The Bishop's Dinner. 
robert from his country cell obeyed the big cathedral bell bishop of rhymes and the monk was he famed for his blithesome sanctity walking slowly as he was wont his server laddie marching in front returning home through street and square the saint recited his office prayer a rich man met him and thus did say my lord pray dine with me to-day dinner is ready the board is spread come in and bless our daily bread to-day i may not dine with you for a holy mass i am overdue smiled the good man i must hasten back for as yet the bread of heaven i lack then if with me you may not dine you shall have at home a dinner fine a client has brought yon big fat goose here lad take this and don't let it loose struggled the boy with the cumbrous bird tightened his arm the goose to gird and ho he welleth well a day for the crackling monster had flown away loud was the cry of the server child soft was the voice of the bishop mild to console the lad his only care till he resumed his morning prayer presently every passer-by saw a big bird high up in the sky saw a great goose come fluttering down over the roofs of the ancient town soon o'er rigobert's holy head hovered the goose that lately fled soon it lay in the city street prone at rigobert's saintly feet then the boy with a gladsome cry recaptured the monster eagerly brought it safely to jimacour right to the bishop's very door but not for the spit was that goose designed on it the old saint never dined to the people's joy and wonderment it followed him whithersoever he went that bird became the good man's pet and for aught i know it is living yet what is certain and sure is this as long as it lived it lived in bliss end of section eighteen section nineteen of milor of the silver hand and other stories of the bright ages this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Melor of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages by David Byrne. St. Wollstone and the Chorister. All sweetly sang the choiring boys walking in Wollstone's holy train they sang of high unearthly joys where saints unnumbered reign all things shall fade and time shall cease but heaven remains when life is past only the things that make for peace eternal peace can last as to himself the bishop talked and murmured heavenly joys abide a sunny gold-haired choir lad walked close to the prelate's side yea these shall fall st wolstan said stroking the curls so thick so fair one day my child upon thy head shall not be found a hair the boy looked up with troubled mien o oh, father must i lose them all tears gathered in his quivering e'en pray that they may not fall the bishop's smile was kind and sweet his glance was pitiful and mild an inward prayer he did repeat blessing the singing child while wolstan lives my little son you shall not lose your curly shock from off this head shall fall not one soft silky golden lock years fled so old-time writers tell true was the thing that wolstan said from the grown man not one hair fell until the saint was dead end of section nineteen End of Milor of the Silver Hand and Other Stories of the Bright Ages by David Byrne.